Hello, I am Grace Gates. I am interviewing Mr. Zachary Kinney on behalf of the Veterans History Project for the Office of Congresswoman Donna F. Edwards and the Library of Congress. We are working in conjunction with Prince George's Community College and PGCC TV. Today's date is October 29th, 2015, and we are located in the television studios of Prince George's College in Lago, Maryland. Our producer and director of the project is Justin Smothers. In the room, we have Brandon Williams, Dominique Thomas, and Zach Goldsmith. The project is being coordinated by Dr. Sherelle Williams and the Mass Communication Department of Prince George's Community College. The purpose of this interview is to gain insight into the life of United States military veterans currently residing in the state of Maryland. I've recently met Mr. Kinney and hope to get his perspective and stories about his experience and his life before, during, and after military service. Let's begin. Okay. Um, Mr. Kinney, how would you like to me for, to address you, sir? Um, would you like me to? Uh, since this is a program talking about veterans, uh, Major Zach Kinney works. Okay. Yeah. Major Zach Kinney. All righty. Um, where were you born, sir? Uh, I was born in Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of your fondest memories of childhood? I, I recall um, living in the Alexandria section of mm -hmm. uh, Alexander right down route, off of Route 1, mm -hmm. they called the Birdie, very close to Woodrow Wilson Bridge. I remember that. Um, I recall um, moving to D.C., um, mm -hmm. actually living uh, basically on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. uh, going to a school on Capitol Hill called Giddings Elementary. Um, I remember uh, the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I was in elementary school um, when that, the day that that happened. And, the day it happened, I, I was home with my mother. I had streptococcus, strep throat. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the day before, the day after, but I do remember the assassination of President Kennedy. Oh, okay, that must have been something. Um, do you mind sharing your birth date, sir? Not at all, 16 April, 1954. Okay, so in other words, that's April 16th, right. 1954, okay. Right. For those of us who don't use the uh, the date like um, military do. Um, <clears throat> tell me about your parents. Uh, what did they do for <coughs> occupations? My father was a World War II uh, war hero. He fought in the Asiatic Pacific. Mm. Um, he was wounded in combat. Um, at the time when the hydrogen bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he was on the island of Guam. Uh, and the American forces who were in that theater at the time were ordered to go underground um, while they dropped the hydrogen bombs. Wow. And 72 hours later, they were told that the war was over uh, and they were gonna be part of an army of occupation to go into Japan anyway uh, mm -hmm. to bring that conflict to an end. Um, my dad was exposed to radiation um, and it um, caused him to, um, I guess, uh, max out at somewhere around 102 pounds when he went in the army, he was like 165 muscular. Mm. But after he was wounded in combat and he got exposed to the radiation, oh, wow. he could never gain more than 102 pounds and at the time of death he was 92 pounds. Mm. Oh. But he went into the Department of War, or uh, at that time it was called the Department of War, eventually the Department of, Je of Defense, mm. and he worked for the Department of the Army okay. and um, raised our family that way. Uh, my mom, she was a housewife. Mm -hmm. and uh, took care of uh, my brothers and sisters and me. Okay, um, and um, that was my next question. Do you have siblings and how many? Um, I had uh, f four brothers mm -hmm. and three sisters and I was the eighth child. My youngest brother, who was the youngest member of the family, his name was Timothy, he died at age one in his sleep from deaf pneumonia. Okay, um, so you were the actual, the seventh child, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, where did you grow up? 
I grew up in Southeast Washington, D.C., okay. and then moved to Northeast Washington, okay. um, and then uh, moved out into Maryland in the Sea Pleasant area, and attended Fremont Heights in your high school. Okay. Did, did any of your um, family members serve in the military other than your father and yourself? Yes, my oldest brother Stanley was an Air Force jet engine mechanic. Ooh. He fought during the Vietnam War. Okay. And currently I have a nephew, my oldest brother Stan's oldest son, his name is Dupre. Mm -hmm. He's a full bird colonel in the U.S. Army. Oh. Um, can we go back to your school days? Who were some of your best friends growing up? Um, mm -hmm. uh, Beverly, um, which, who was a guy, mm -hmm. Clarence Beverly. Um, Fatris Majette, um, uh, Sheila Johnson, um, um, Laverne McNeil, um, Walter uh, Tardy, uh, Victor Andrews. Mm -hmm. Those were some of the guys and folk I hung out with. Do you have any uh, stories that you would uh, like to share? Uh, yeah, I um, I recall um, um, one time when I was at Randall Junior High School, mm -hmm. I was one of the you know, good kids, stay out of trouble. A couple of my friends had names that, that uh, could arguably be, be a girl's name or a guy's name. Like I had a friend named Terry and a, a guy named Kim and a friend named Renee. Um, they were friends also. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, because they had those names, going to inner city school was kind of rough. And we got messed over all the time. I got messed over because I hung with them. Um, and I remember one time it was snowing like crazy. So everybody had to go into the cafeteria. Nobody could go outside. And we're in this long line because everybody on this occasion was trying to get something to eat. And nobody was going out because it was just too cold and too much ice and snow. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, the bullies, him and his buds, jumping in front of us, then turning around to Renee and saying, hey, Renee, w when we're going out to dinner, after having busted in front of us. Mm -hmm. And I can see Renee putting his books down. And I knew he was going to punch the guy out. And it's like, no, Renee, don't do it. And he turned around, sucker punch, and knocked the bully out and started a food fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, goodness. What high school did you attend? Fairmont Heights in your high school. OK. District Heights, Maryland. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? Before I went into the uh, Air Force, uh, I had just completed law school uh, and took the bar exam mm -hmm. and became an attorney at law. Oh, and I was looking for employment. And I was also playing chess. Um, and I was uh, raising my youngest son, Zachary, Jr. Um, well, what college did you attend? Undergraduate, I attended the University of Maryland at College Park, mm -hmm. and my major was political science and Afro American studies. Okay. Um, was it before your service or after? You already told me that it was before your service. Um, in which branch did you serve, sir? I served in the United States Air Force. Okay. And how and why did you choose that branch? Um, actually, um, when I was in my last semester in law school, I attended Antioch School of Law in Washington, D.C., um, two recruiters came to the school, JAG recruiters. Mm -hmm. A JAG is a military term for a military lawyer. Um, a Navy JAG officer and a Marine JAG officer came to the school. Uh, the Army, Air Force, Coast Guards, uh, they, didn't, they didn't send anybody. Um, so I didn't even know they had JAG departments. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the the, com the commander, um, Reichert, who was the Navy JAG recruiter, he left the brochure behind talking about the benefits and all that stuff, and, and, the, and the brochure was so slick, I was hooked. <laughs> he, had a, he had a Navy JAG officer getting off a helicopter on an aircraft carrier, and he had his hat with the gold butt buckle on it, and uh, man, I just was hooked. That's what I wanted to be. I didn't want to go in the Marines, because they were talking about going to tank school, and in Quantico and killing people and doing all that weird stuff, not practicing law. And I said, nah, that ain't for me. So I applied as soon as I passed the bar um, later that same year um, to the Navy. And the Navy was in the process of getting ready to approve my application and bring me on. My oldest brother was still in the Air Force. He was a Vietnam War vet. And he was stationed at Andrews. And he asked me, are you going to apply to the Air Force? And I said, does the Air Force have a Jack Department? He says, yeah, all of them do. What are you talking about? 
And it, and you're gonna apply there because nobody in our families has served in the Navy. Okay. And I applied to the Air Force, and the Air Force contacted me and says, "Hey, we like you. Come on in. Let's do an interview." And I did that. And and then three days later, they said, "Hey, um, uh, we're gonna bring you on board, uh, do the direct appointee program as a first lieutenant." in the JAG department of the U.S. Air Force. Wow. A week later, the Navy called and said, you ready to go, Kenny? So I'm already in the Air Force. Hmm. What were some of the best memories that you have about selecting this branch? Well, um, I really enjoyed uh, my time in the Air Force. Everything about it, I really loved it. Um, including, um, you know, being a, a hard-nosed prosecutor. I was an assistant district attorney at entry level. Um, and I did real well at it because I, I went to a school that, that did clinics. Mm -hmm. And the clinics showed me the ropes and got me um, ready to go even before I was uh, an actual practicing attorney. Okay. Um, how long did you serve? I served for 20 years, from 1 May uh, 1984 to 1 May 2004. Okay. Um, what was the highest rank you achieved, sir? Major. Major, okay. Which in the Navy ranks would have been equivalent to a lieutenant commander. Oh. Okay. Are you proud of your accomplishments? Yes, I why, am. Why are you proud of your I'm accomplishments? I'm proud of my accomplishments because I, I was able to help uh, uh, the armed forces out. Mm -hmm. I was able to help our country out, myself, my family. And uh, I was doing, it, doing something I always wanted to do, and that's practice law. Oh, okay. <coughs> um, your early service, sir. Can we talk about your military training? Uh, where were you trained at? Um, since I came in through the direct appointee program, uh, I was sent to Maxwell Air Force Base um, in Montgomery, Alabama to attend AFUC, which is Air Force Officers Orientation Course. There was a two week one course to teach me how to salute, wear the uniform, the courtesies and traditions, and then mm -hmm. and how to march in formation. And we had PT, um, so we could stay in shape and and not get fat and overweight. And then I went to uh, JSOC, um, still at Maxwell, as soon as I finished AFUG. JSOC is called the, the Judge Advocate Staff's Orientation Course. And that was a 13-week course at Maxwell um, where we learned how to practice military law. Because there's really nowhere in the United States where you can learn military law but in the military. Mm -hmm. And the, all the service branches have their own law schools. I attended the Air Force's law school for purposes of training. Mm -hmm. I was already an attorney of law and had my, practice practice, my license to practice law um, before I joined the Air Force because the Air Force can't and the military cannot make lawyers, just like they can't make doctors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you go from your training location? Uh, how different was the environment there from where you grew up? Um, from Maxwell Air Force Base uh, training I went back to Dover Air Force Base, Delaware, mm -hmm. to my um, base of assignment okay. and continued as a base level prosecutor or assistant district attorney or assistant state's attorney. Okay. How different was the environment there from, from where you grew up? And uh, they say the military culture is different. Uh, did you notice any big differences? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you're kind of like on duty 24 hours a day. You never was ever off duty because mm -hmm. you were required to um, follow the law and not do anything wrong, even when you're out of uniform, and not bring discredit to the service or your uniform. Um, uh, so the military life was all encompassing, and you had to salute and um, return salutes, and you had to uh, uh, wear, wear the uniform correctly, clean and, and neatly, and um, you had to keep your health and your weight. Um, right, because um, if you got overweight or you, you got bad health, that could jeopardize your military career. Um, it's not like that in the civilian world. Okay. Plus, in the military world, um, if you don't like your supervisor, you can't tell him that he's a, um, you know, a, a rear end, mm -hmm. um, because if you do, you'll get put in, in jail. Uh, outside in the civilian world, you can tell your supervisor anything. They won't put you in jail. They may fire you, mm -hmm. but they won't put you in jail. But in the military, they'll put you in jail. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, <coughs> did you find anything comforting about the military? Yeah. I mean, they, they took care of you. They took care of, you know, um, they gave you houses. They gave you um, 
that you can live in with your family. Mm -hmm. um, they give you allowances, stipends. Um, they um, looked over you to make sure you're taking care of yourself and beat you up if you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, they gave you awards and decks, decorations when you did good. Um, yeah, it, was, it was just great. I just really, really liked it. Okay. Uh, do you remember any of your instructors? What do you remember most about them? In the military? Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember um, a couple. Um, um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Wallach, um, um, Major McDonald, mm -hmm. um, uh, Bris Major Brisbane, um, Major Horde. Uh, the, I remember them because they were real good and they were telling us how to become JAG officers. Okay. Um, were you trained with a, with all, with an all female group? Uh, no, we had females mixed in with us, like oh. co-ed. Okay. Um, they were not in a separate unit. We were all females and then all males. Okay. Um, what? Uh, okay, you said. Um, what What was it like to be trained in a co-ed group? Same as it was with, with anybody else when I was in college or outside the military. It was really no different. Mm -hmm. They just were wearing a uniform like I was. Okay. And some of them outranked me and I was some outranked. And for the ones who outranked me, I had to dress them as ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, for the ones that were beneath me they, that I outranked, they called me sir. Okay. I've heard that uh, boot camp can be really tough. What do you think prepared you best for surviving it? Um, I didn't actually attend boot camp. Mm. Um, for the professional ranks, mm -hmm. um, doctors, chaplains, and lawyers, they come in through what is known as a direct appointee program. They don't go through boot camp. Oh. And the reason why is because if you subject them to boot camp, by the time they've gone through med school and law school and practiced law and medicine and chaplaincy, um, they're too old to be going through boot camp. Um, so what they do is they do an Air Force officer's orientation course mm. um, when they treat the, teach them the courtesies and customs and work them out for about two weeks. Um, and then they send them to their, um, their service school. Um, I went to the JAG school. Okay. The doctors go to some kind of medical school um, within the military, teach military medicine. And the chaplains go to some kind of um, military chaplaincy program okay. to indoctrinate them so that they can serve in the ranks that they were brought in. So, I mean, does that include a kind of a, a, a physical training as well? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. both uh, classroom and physical. Okay. AFUC, for example, Air Force Officer Orientation Course, which uh, didn't just consist of new lawyers in the Air Force, it consisted of new lawyers, new doctors, and new chaplains. Okay. Um, they were mixed in with us. And they would teach us how to march. They taught us how to salute, how to wear the uniform. They taught us military courtesy and customs and tradition and history. Uh, can you describe some of the most challenging parts of that physical training? Yeah, um, getting used to running uh, uh, three miles uh, every morning before the sun came up. That was mm -hmm. kind of a little challenging. Mm -hmm. Hadn't done that ever before. And then, you know, showering up and, and shaving and getting something to eat and then staying within um, military bearings and, and traditions and saluting right and make sure your uniform is, your gig line is straight and you're wearing everything right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a challenge. That was big time. Uh, d did you ever serve abroad? I did. And how was that experience, sir? I served at, at 13th Air Force Clark Air Base, Republic of the Philippines from 1 January 89 until 1 September 2001. And basically, I mean, 1991, excuse me. Um, that was wonderful until we started getting all kind of natural calamities hitting us. Mm -hmm. Like we had typhoons that were killer typhoons racking the base. Mm -hmm. We had um, an insurgency there called the New People's Army who was trying to kill us because mm -hmm. um, they were trying to get us out of the country. They didn't want us there. And then um, on 15 June 1990, um, the third worst volcano explosion in the 20th century happened on our runway. Mount Pinatubo erupted mm -hmm. and destroyed Clark Air Base, um, a base that had been in the Philippines since 
1898. Wow. And we finally closed it in September 1991 because we had a killer volcano on our runway. And mm. it's kind of hard to do business with a killer volcano on your runway. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about that? I thought it was the end of the world. I thought mm. I was going to die. Oh. Um, and I decided to hunker down and take all the notes I could and because this I knew was history in the making. I knew the base was going to eventually have to be closed. Okay. Um, and I wrote a book about it um, after it was all over and I got back to Safe Harbor. Uh, the book is called um, uh, Mount Pinatubo and the Destruction of Clark Air Base. Mm. Um, the Bug Out Diary. Oh. Um, was it on a military plane or a ship or a train that you did your first uh, deployment? Uh, it was on the on land, actually. Mm -hmm. I flew by by airplane to the base okay. and served on the base. Oh, okay. Um, did you know anyone else who was being deployed with you to the same location? No, I didn't know the people who were being deployed with me okay. before the before they got there. And I got there. What type of reception did you have once you got there? Um, I had the the, the base legal office uh, meeting me basically at the airport, me and my family because my wife and son, Zach Jr., um, we showed up after 22 hours flying from Washington National Airport to Clark Air, Air Base Republic of the Philippines. Okay. Uh, what expectations um, did you have as you arrived, and um, did the reality meet your ex expectations? My dad actually served in the Philippines during World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and he talked a lot about it when I was small to me and my brothers, mm -hmm. all his war stories. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had a picture of, of Clark and the Philippines being the way it was when he went. But when I got there, it was much more modernized and it did not look anything like what it looked like when my dad was there. What was the biggest surprise? The biggest surprise was the, um, uh, the, the base was modernized mm -hmm. and the town outside of it was modern. Um, I thought people were living in Nipah huts and, and it was real backwards and slow, but it turned out to be a, a regular city with automobiles and everything else, everything you see in a regular city, an American city had. Okay. I've heard that a lot of people don't even sleep at first. How did you feel in your first few days? Did the feelings change after you were there for a while? Took a couple of days to get used to the time di differential. Mm -hmm. We were 13 hours ahead of um, the time zone back here in, in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, and it took time to, for my body to adjust to, you know, normally when I, when I would be asleep there, I'd be up here, and when I'd be up there, I'd be asleep here. So it took some time to get that right. Okay. Um, did, did they change while you were there? Uh, what did you enjoy most about your assignment? And what did you enjoy least? I don't know the question about change. It was different from being in the United States. Mm. We're in a foreign country, um, living among foreign nationals, the Filipino people. They were very warm. Um, they were very helpful. Um, it's just like anybody, any other society and culture. They had the good, they had the bad, and they had the ugly. Okay. How were you involved in this combat effort? With whom did you work on your part of the project? During the time that I was on active duty, I experienced two wars. Mm -hmm. um, the first Gulf War from 1990 to 91 in Iraq. Operation um, Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm. Um, uh, when Saddam Hussein was president of Iraq. Uh, and I played a support officer's role, um, helping GIs get into the theater, dealing with the legal issues that would prevent them from getting there. Uh, I was a support officer, not a line officer. Okay. Um, and then the second war effort that I was involved in was the second Gulf War um, from basically 2001 um, to, to about two years ago when President Obama pulled the troops out of Iraq. Okay. Um, Were you able to stay in contact with family and friends I actually and lost also the people that were on the project with you? I lost connection with him because of the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Mm -hmm. Can you share what you remember uh, most about the, that experience? And were you able to stay, um, 
How did you do that? I mean, as far as, you know, getting, um, staying in contact with the people, your family and friends and whatnot? Well, um, at Clark, when I was there, um, we became very close knit to the Filipinos who were working with us. Okay. We had uh, Filipino lawyers mm -hmm. and um, an administrative staff and um, clerks, uh, notaries, um, and of course we had the Americans working there too, side by side with the Filipinos. And there was uh, the Philippine Air Force was co-located at Clark with the U.S. Air Force. Okay. So we came in contact with their troops too. So. Th it, it required adjustment and understanding them and them understanding us, and mm -hmm. it went pretty good. Uh, were you homesick? Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how did those contacts make you feel? I mean, contacts that you made over there in uh, the Philippines. It made me feel real good because I got a chance to meet people who lived in a different part of the world, mm -hmm. and over time we became the best of friends. Oh, okay. And I still, every now and then, converse with them. Oh, good. Um, were you engaged directly in combat missions? Um, no, I was a, um, a support officer, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't see any action on the battlefield. I was supporting the troops who were going in the battlefield. Uh, what did you do for relaxation and recreation uh, when you were not on duty? I played chess. Um, I uh, went and toured the local area. Um, I went to movies, restaurants. Um, um, I used to go watch parades at, at 13th Air Force Parade Ground. Um, I used to go to see my son play basketball and football, and, and I eventually became a coach and and was the coach for my son's football team there. Um, we were the Redskins, and it was the Bantam League. Okay. Um, were there different activities for women uh, versus men? Yeah, there were some activities where women could uh, do crocheting, they could um, uh, do knitting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there were some um, clubs that were clubs for women only, where the women wanted to be in a club alone, not men in it. Um, yeah, so there were things like that there. Okay. Um, were there stresses associated with your duties? And how did you handle the stress or pressure when no longer engaged? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of pressure. Um, I was the top prosecutor at Clark, and we were doing between 55 and 60 criminal courts or court martials a year. Um, when I was at Dover, we did 20 a year. Um, so uh, that was pretty pretty busy and pretty stressful, trying to keep up with that workload. And what I would do after do to try to lower the pressure is I'd spend time with Zach, and my second child was born in the Philippines. His name is Ryan. And so bringing him up and raising him and spending time with the family, that was the way I, I, I dealt with pressure. Okay, did you do anything special for good luck? For good luck? Um, mm -hmm. Just had a rabbit foot. <laughs> okay. Um, how did you feel when witnessing destruction during combat? Well, um, I actually did not see combat, mm -hmm. but I saw a lot of my troops who went out and when some of them came back and some got killed, and I would attend the memorial services. And that was very stressful and very painful to see some of my buds go into the war zone in harm's way and get killed. Okay. Um, how was military service impacted, um, your feelings about the war and military in general? Well, I supported both wars. Um, I didn't have a problem with them. Mm -hmm. I know there were some people that did have problems, but I didn't. I understood why they were being done and and, um, you know, freedom isn't free. It, it costs, there's a price on it. And I wanted to do all I could to help us win that war uh, within what I was doing in my career field. Okay. Thank you so much. But I just have one or two more questions. What message would you like to leave for the future, um, the future generation who will view this interview? Military is still a, a great way of life. I actually feel that um, uh, everybody who can should should go in the military. You learn a lot. Okay. You learn to appreciate your country, and you also get an opportunity to serve your country. Is there anything else you feel like we haven't discussed, or do you want to add something else? 
No, not really. Um, other than to say that um, the 20 years I was an actor did wonderful. I got an opportunity to do a lot of different jobs. I got an opportunity to meet a lot of different people from all over the world, mm -hmm. all over the U.S., um, Friends for Life. Um, it was just a wonderful experience, and um, if I do it all again, I'd do it again. Okay. When exactly did your war service end? Uh, it would have ended when I got out of the Air Force on 1 May 2004. Okay. Because the second Gulf War was going on then when I got out. Okay. Um, had the war ended when you released, when you were released to come back stateside? No, it hadn't ended. It was still going on. Okay. When did you get home? Uh, I got home uh, somewhere around uh, um, June uh, 2004, 1 June 2004. Okay. I want to thank you so much. This has been a Veterans History Project interview for 2015. I would like to thank the officers of Donna F. Edwards, Prince George's Community College, and the Communication Department, PGCC TV, and especially Mr. Zachary Kenny. No problem at all, and thank you very much for having me on your show. All right.